So the good looking keyboard you just saw is a brand new GK68XS wireless 65% keyboard from Evo Maker, an upgrade to the GK68. The GK68XS comes standard with hot swap sockets, a fully programmable PCB, metal plate, top and bottom mounted PCB LEDs, die sub PBT XDA keycaps, and USB-C connection with options for Gatoron or Cherry switches, and a choice between plastic or aluminum case. The one I'm going to be reviewing is spec'd out to a very competitive price of 95 US dollars. For 95 bucks, you're getting a lot of value for your money, but like the GK68 before it, the GK68XS does have some design choices that are unique that may or may not appeal to you, so let's take a look. Out of the box, the configuration that Epo Makers sent over to me contains the GK68XS itself, the split space bar module, three additional switches, in my case Gatoron Browns, and three space bar keycaps. We also have a metal switch puller, plastic keycap puller, USB-C cable, and a paper manual, which unfortunately you'll be using a lot more than you'd think, but more on that later. This keyboard is sized at 65% and comes with a plastic case that has a very familiar design. Many different cases use this style. It's non-adjustable, it has a fairly neutral stance, and it's not excessively tall, and complements the included XDA keycaps pretty well. On the top left, you have a USB-C connection that should be standard on every keyboard. The older GK68 did have one, but it was located on the right side of the board, and that kind of killed your options for aftermarket cases. So it's nice to see that's changed. Nothing on the bottom aside from the Sky Long logo, which is most likely the ODM for Epo Maker. This is similar to the Ampro 2 where Obens Lab is the manufacturer and Sionic is the distributor in North America. So nothing out of the ordinary here. There is an option for an aluminum case, but since I don't have it, I really don't have any comments for it other than it looks strikingly similar to the KBD fans 5 degree 60% case. So if you're a fan of that and didn't really care for the 60% form factor, this may be a good option for you. The switches on my board are the Gatoron Browns, but Epo Maker does offer a pretty good selection to choose from, as long as it's from Gatoron or Cherry. Of course, it doesn't matter too much since you can swap in any MX compatible switch, and they even have an option for you to buy the keyboard without the switches on board. What's nice about the GK68X's PCB board is that it has the mounting holes needed by PCB mounted switches, so say you want to run something like Zilios, you don't have to go through and trim the legs off. Very nice. The switches are mounted to the keyboard with a metal plate. It looks solid and does seem to contribute to a low ping typing experience right out of the box. But one issue I did have with the plate is when you're using the included switch puller. You seem to need surgical precision when swapping out the switches or it can leave behind quite a few marks. Some cases it's just minor metal transfer onto the white paint, others legit scratches, so do be careful. Thankfully with the caps on, you don't really see it at all. Aside from that, the switches swap in and out smoothly without any need for excessive force. So overall, pretty impressive. The stabilizer for this keyboard come lubed straight from the factory. So for many people that have never experienced this, this is gonna be a very pleasant surprise. I really like how this feature is becoming standard on new keyboards these days. Though I did notice that the add-on spacebar wasn't for some reason. This keyboard standout feature is easily the modular split spacebar. You have the ability to convert a full-size 6.25U spacebar into a split setup size at what I'm pretty sure is 2.75, 2.25, and 1.25 using the included spacebar module to add additional functionality. To do the swap, you'll have to remove the spacebar and the switch under it, then remove the three exposed screws on the plate. Then pop out the unit, drop in the new module, add your switches and caps, and you're good to go. I love the modularity and flexibility that this thing brings to the keyboard, but I did notice one design issue. The stabs on the 6.5U module is positioned right above one of the sockets, and since the stabs are lubed, it does leave behind some residue. Now I'm not sure what kind of long-term issues we might run into, but do keep it in mind. I've swapped this module out a ton of times for this video, but so far no issues on my end. But if I do go back to a single space layout permanently, I'll definitely look into covering the sockets with some captain tape or some sort of band-aid mod. The spacebar is not the only thing that is unconventional about this keyboard. I'm sure you've noticed by now, but the spacebar is not in its usual spot. It's shifted over one U to make room for the tilde key. Now this is something that was carried over from the GK68, and for me coming from a 60% keyboard, 
it's a little weird. It felt like the keyboard was essentially reduced in size since my muscle memory is set to hit the left side of the key. And it took quite a bit of time to get used to. And if I'm being honest with you, I'm not quite 100% there yet, but there are a couple layouts that did help alleviate this problem. We haven't gone to the software side of things yet, but this keyboard is fully programmable. So what I did was I remapped the keys to mimic a pseudo HHKB keyboard by swapping the backspace key and the pipe key. I really like the setup and it feels really close to normal. What I also tried doing was taking advantage of the split spacebar setup. I currently have the spacebar setup as a trigger for FN3 or function layer three, space and backspace. In this layout, I found my hand to be in a much more neutral position and it doesn't move as far away from the home roll as it normally does. There's definitely more mental overhead with this configuration since it's brand new, but once you're used to it, it's pretty fast. The keycaps included come in what's called the granite colorway and are die sub PBT. They have a very nice texture to them, less gritty compared to ones included on mass drop boards, which can feel a little bit coarse at times. The keycaps are nice and thick, and of course, die sub legends, these are gonna last you a very long time. Now this is no surprise though, the GK68 came with some really nice PBT DSA caps as well, but the XS model does something a little different. Instead of going with the same old DSA keycap, they went with the XTA. The short explanation of this profile is the keys are slightly taller, have a tapered angle that allows for a flatter surface at the top, which results in more surface area for your fingers. Now before we continue, let's do a sound test just to see what kind of typing experience all of these components put together can produce. All right, what do you guys think? I think this sounds really good for a keyboard straight out of the box, and it sounds way better than any mainstream gaming keyboard you get at this price point. The only thing that's a bit rough to me is the split spacebar module, but that's because there's no leap from the factory, but nothing that you can't fix yourself. I think anyone that picks up this keyboard will be very happy with how this thing sounds. The RGB functionality of this keyboard is full featured and comparable to other keyboards on the market, offering complete per key RGB control and a good variety of embedded RGB modes. The LEDs used on this keyboard are bright, provide great coverage, and looks really smooth with the white XTA keycaps. Evo Maker doesn't market this, probably because their case offerings don't showcase it, but the PCB also has RGB LEDs at the bottom for that nice underglow look. It's a shame an acrylic or polycarbonate case isn't an option at the higher than high end tier. You can access the RGB modes with the FN key and backspace to turn on the lights. You can control the light intensity with FN plus arrow up and down, and you can change the speed of the effects using FN left and right arrow. Or you can even pause them using FN and the pipe key. There are two pools of lighting profiles you can pick from. FN plus the left bracket gives you the reactive RGB modes. You can have the lights react to your key presses or you can use the onboard mic to have the lights react to ambient sound. I have to admit, I ended up liking this feature a whole lot more than I thought it would. Check it out. Reactive RGB profiles aren't your only option. Using the FN plus right bracket gives you access to the center light profiles that I'm sure you've seen a million times in the past. And if you don't like any of the ones on board, you can change them in software. 
The FN key isn't just for your RGB controls. The GK68XS has five function layers, one standard, one driver, and then three that are used for onboard memory. They can be activated using the FN key through our hotkeys, and in the software, you can control per key mappings, create and set RGB profiles, and you can do some really cool stuff with macros, but actually using it, there's a bit of a learning curve. So yeah, let's talk about that. First of all, all the changes in the settings have to be done over USB, not Bluetooth. It's not a problem. All the other manufacturers do this as well. Like the GK68, this keyboard does not support QMK, which on its own doesn't automatically mean that it's bad. The Ampro 2, for example, does not support QMK, but OpenSys UX ZX implementation on the software is simple, clean, and intuitive enough that you kind of forgive and forget the shortcomings. However, when an implementation is done poorly, even when you have great hardware, it kind of dilutes the overall experience. So for someone that might be buying this as their first fully customizable keyboard, the UI configuration of the various options can be a little intimidating. It's cluttered. You have all these windows with no clear explanation of how to utilize each properly. It's confusing. Lighting profiles have arbitrary names that don't seem to properly show on the keyboard unless you're in the driver profile. But when you're in this profile, you can't change the FN layer. Maybe I'm missing something, but that kind of goes into my next point. It's not intuitive. As you use the software, you'll see little stop deny logos with no explanation of why it's showing up. And as you're remapping FN layer keys, you'll see that this area here, it means that a key is reserved for critical functions with no idea of which functions they're mapped to. In this case, FN plus Z is used to connect Bluetooth device one. So you'd be in this weird situation where you're customizing your key layout on the computer, but you also have to reference the paper manual at the same time. Why not just label it in the software? So yeah, a lot of quirks to work around and deal with. But with that said, the onboard controller is actually quite powerful and does allow you to do some really cool things with the lighting profiles and onboard macros. But the software front end just gets the job done and nothing past that really. I'm personally the type that sets up a keyboard once and never touches it again, so this doesn't really bother me at all. So if you're like me, this isn't really a negative, but I do know this is a really important point for many. Another key feature of this keyboard is Bluetooth, and I found it works actually very well. I'm really impressed with this thing. Connection pairing and stability has been great, and I haven't run into any issues with keystrokes dropping, which can't be said about my Amp Pro 2 on both the stable and alpha former branches. The Amp Pro 2 just seems to be really picky about the Bluetooth devices it pairs with and would drop keys every now and then. This Intel NIC, for example, is problematic for the Amp Pro 2, but not for the GK68XS. You can store up to three devices, which is assigned using the FN key in combination with Z, X, and C. Pairing is really easy. To enter the pairing mode, just hold down the FN and whichever bank you want configured. In my case, Z. Hold down that key until it starts flashing. Then on the device you're trying to connect to, look for GK68XS and connect. It really is that easy. To switch from device to device, you just have to hit the FN and the device key. I have my Windows Workstation on Z and MacBook Pro on X, and switching between the two devices has been seamless. The battery life on this keyboard has been on par with the Amp Pro 2, which also has a 1900 milliamp hour battery. Working from home, I've been putting a lot of hours on this keyboard with the LEDs off, and so far it's gone a week without any issues. If I had to nitpick, there are two features that I would have liked to see in regards to the Bluetooth. The first is the ability to read the battery life. This keyboard does have the ability to warn you when it's in a low voltage state under the Alt key, but it does not give you a readout like the Amp Pro 2 does in 10% increments. The Amp Pro 2 also has a physical power switch for the Bluetooth mode. There's a sleep mode to boost battery life on this keyboard when not in use, but a physical switch would have been nice for people that transport the keyboard around very often. So final thoughts on this keyboard. There's actually a lot of things to love about this keyboard. The keyboard has a very solid build. The plate, keycaps, switches, loops, tabs all come together to give a very clean typing experience 
right out of the box. The PCB hot swap sockets have a proper opening for the PCB mount style switches, and the Bluetooth functionality works really well. The layout falls into neutral category. You're gonna have to determine for yourself if this is the right choice for you or not. With the only minor drawback that I can see being the somewhat messy software, but then again, it does get the job done. So looking at this overall product, I would have no problems recommending this keyboard. Now, Epo Maker is currently launching this product through Kickstarter and is letting their customers customize their keyboards to a certain extent. Their early bird prices for this keyboard can go as low as $75 for a bare bone that comes with no switches, no keycaps, and a plastic case, which allows you to divert some of the cash on items that you may have not wanted towards the ones that you do. Or if you want a complete out of the box experience, you can also let Epo Maker do all of the hard work and buy the maxed out model with cherry switches and a full aluminum case for about $180. I think their shipping cost is gonna be around $10 on top of that, so not bad at all. You can find all the configuration options on their Kickstarter page, or if you're not comfortable with doing that, you can wait for a generic model to hit their Amazon store. Links are down below. After playing with the keyboard for about a week or so, the configuration that speaks out to me the most is actually the cheaper DIY version with no switches and keycaps. I mean, customizing your keyboard is part of the fun, right? So here is an example of the GK68XS with some box royal switches and some Enjoy PBTs. Now, if you wanna see more mods done to this keyboard, let me know in the comments. Painting the case and redoing some of the mods or some things that I'm thinking about doing in the future, Maybe you guys can vote on the color and let me know what you guys think would look good on this keyboard. Now, before I leave you with another sound test, because I know you guys enjoy that so much, I hope you enjoyed the video. Like, subscribe, it really helps me out, and I'll see you guys next time.